We, we think that transmission between birds is very common and there have been literally hundreds of millions of birds affected internationally. Transmission into what we call a dead end host, that is somewhere where you, it doesn't go into other um, animals or people like cows in this setting, but also things like raccoons and foxes and, and cats, for example, we think probably occurs reasonably frequently and typically the animals are not so sick as, as the birds, which of course typically die. Mm -hmm. But what about the transmission to humans? How common is that? We, we think again, that's really only in, in very close contact with a large numbers of, of ill birds and we think it's probably occurring infrequently, but not as rarely as you might think, given the sort of numbers we talk about. Typically, again, a human doesn't then transmit on to other humans or even to other animals. And usually people are well, although there have been a number of deaths. There's, there's been a total of 130 people died, but that's internationally. That is also over a period of um, over well, almost 30 years, so since 1996. So fortunately, that number is relatively small, certainly compared to what the deaths we've seen in, in animals. Yeah. So how do you contain a bird flu outbreak like this? Uh, with difficulty is the, the short answer. Mm -hmm. um, because it's typically in very large numbers of birds and it spreads very quickly. Fortunately, the birds are usually recognised um, early and certainly where large numbers of infections have occurred in places like Southeast Asia, in places like China, um, less so in Europe and Africa. But people have become accustomed to recognising it. You see rapid changes in the birds and rapid death and by rapid over a period of a day. People are then culling birds and putting in place, I guess, ring fencing and that culling plus control has typically been very successful in, in preventing further spread. Yeah. Let's come closer to our neighbourhood and Japanese authorities are warning about a surge in potentially lethal strep throat infections in Tokyo particularly. They've tripled there. How serious is this? It's a very serious infection. We do always see small numbers, fortunately, but Group A strep often causes infections. It's a cause of sore throats. It can infect the skin. The, the more severe cases of what we call streptococcal toxic shock syndrome and other generalised infections can cause death. And so up to a third of people who acquire that type of infection can die. Fortunately, small numbers, but again, it, it can be quite you know frightening. It's in, probably related to the changes in uh, the way that we wash our hands and uh, in Japan it does appear that like other countries um, the infection control that we had with COVID, washing hands, masks, um, you know, social distancing, all those things when they come off, came off was certainly associated with increase in general infections, respiratory infections but also in things like group A streptococcus and, and that's what causes this syndrome that's being seen in in Japan as well as elsewhere in the world including Australia. Yeah that is interesting and you know some experts are blaming COVID itself for the spike so what do you make of that or is it simply because of COVID um, our immune systems are a little bit weaker or, or not so ready to manage this kind of infection? It's a very good question. There's not been a direct relationship between uh, SARS infection and COVID and Group A strep. And it's very important to realise that, you know, we've had 700, over 700 million cases of, of COVID internationally. We're talking about a handful of cases and much smaller, notwithstanding that that's clearly very serious and it's important to, to look at it. And it is controllable by antibiotics. The The effect of COVID on the immune system is still being worked out, but it appears more likely that it's an infection control. It's, a, it's, a, it's an increased risk of getting it rather than something that COVID's done to our bodies. But there is research into that and it's important that that continues. Yeah, and I'm interested, Bill, in what your thoughts are about this sort of contention around using the term long, long COVID. Look, I think that th there's no doubt that a group of people, um, and and probably a, because of the large numbers of COVID cases, a relatively large number of people who are have prolonged symptoms, and they include things like fatigue. 
and brain fog and, and things that are well described. There's also a group which overlaps with that who, who have ongoing physical symptoms, particularly heart, um, uh, neurological symptoms, things like stroke and um, heart disease are certainly in high rates of infected people at one, two and, and three years following infection. How long that continues to go for is really something that that needs to be researched. Whether the term is used or not, I think there's no doubt that there are post-viral syndromes, there are post-COVID viral syndromes, and they need to be researched and looked into. And the terminology you use is, is really what's best for people. Yeah. Uh, it's more important for researching it. It's an interesting point because I think some people feel sort of shut out if 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 it isn't acknowledged to a degree that there are post-viral symptoms, whether it's something for co like COVID or other viruses that circulate. Very important point. But you, it's important also to remember that post-influenza syndromes occur, other post-viral syndromes occur. And this has been an un, you know, unprecedented pandemic. 700 million people, you are going to have a number of post-viral syndromes in these people and they need to be taken seriously, investigated and looked at. And what you call them is is less important than treating those people uh, respectfully and and as, as having an illness that needs to be looked into. Yeah. Tell me too what your thoughts are. There have been other things that have popped up. You've seen num a, a big spike in the cases of shingles, for example. You're hearing of some reports of potentially viral related hearing losses. Um, is there any proof that this is related to COVID? It, it, I think it needs to be taken disease by disease and we don't have that long. <laughs> um, but it's very important that we do look into that. There, there doesn't seem to be a specific relationship, for example, between COVID and shingles. There's no doubt that generally infectious diseases, which had largely disappeared for the three years of the pandemic, like influenza, they largely disappeared in 2020, 2021, started back 22 and 23. Those things have come back and you would expect other infectious diseases like measles, which is being seen worldwide, things like um, a varicella, chickenpox, to also increase alongside that. That's really infection control related. It doesn't necessarily have to be specifically related to an interaction uh, with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. Yeah, complicated implications. Great to have you on, Bill. Thanks so much. That's a pleasure. Good to talk to you. Likewise.